Okay, people are coming in. Numbers going up. Nice. So Jake, um, I don't know whether you remember this, but uh, you know, four years ago we met in Havana, Cuba, and um, you know we were in a restaurant with Gertrudis, and um, my wife, you know, she has a little bit of a different um, Latin American background than you. She's an army brat, but nonetheless, she grew up in Venezuela as an army brat, and so also is fluent in Spanish. And uh, I remember, you know, I was wondering who is better and whose Spanish is better, yours, yours or hers. And then we were in the restaurant and looking for the word nutmeg, and you actually knew that. <laughs> well, I had, the, I had the advantage of growing up in a restaurant, so that helped. Okay, but she still talks about that. Um, I asked her the other day, so what, what is nutmeg? And uh, I think she, yeah, she remembered it. I, of course, don't. <laughs> So that was funny. So you mentioned that you had actually were back two years later. Yeah, um, I went back to the second um, iteration conference. Right. I think she had another one planned this year, but it got canceled. That's right. Yes. And you know, these have been in place for, uh, for quite a while. I mean, they started, I think, in the late 90s. So I remember, you know, signing up for one <clears throat> when I was barely, I might have still been a postdoc. Um, on a visa and um, I got a letter from um, the Department of um, Commerce um, that they saw my name on the, um, on the web, which was just starting out at that time. And they said, you know, this is an embargo violation. And <laughs> you know, I was in the middle of like applying for a green card and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm not gonna. So I didn't end up going. Um, but Carlos went a number of times. Um, and even when it wasn't legally, he went through Mexico. And, you know, so, yeah. But they are putting a really nice program together. You know, I enjoyed I'm this meeting. I'm consistently program. impressed with that conference. Yeah, it's a great program. And, you know, in Latin, Latin America, people have a pretty positive view of the Cubans because the Cubans send out, they have good medical. Um, expertise and they send out medical groups anytime there's an earthquake or uh, any large natural disaster and that's sort of a at least in Guatemala and uh, you know Costa Rica and other neighboring countries like when you know the Cubans are showing up it's like a cause for celebration because they're bringing medicine and usually good music at the same time. Right yeah yeah they are popular in Venezuela too. Okay so Saray mentioned that the numbers have leveled out um, so you know I'm going to start, say hello to everybody Good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for zooming in uh, in this bi-coastal seminar of uh, the Department of Immunology and Microbiology at Scripps Research. My name is Christoph Rader, and I'm honored uh, to host uh, today's speaker, uh, talk, Dr. Jacob Glanville, who will present on the single step evolution of anti-SARS antibodies to recognize, neutralize, treat SARS-CoV-2. So um, Jake has a very interesting resume uh, with, uh, I think, three anchor points, um, computational antibody engineering, uh, San Francisco, and uh, Guatemala. And uh, those of you uh, who have watched the uh, 2020 Netflix documentary series uh, Pandemic, uh, in which uh, Jake is uh, starring, uh, know what I mean. And for those of you who haven't watched it yet, uh, no, it's not about the COVID-19 pandemic, which actually makes it quite eerie. So um, Jake uh, graduated with a molecular and cell biology BA and substantial uh, bioinformatics skills from Berkeley, after which he joined Pfizer in South uh, San Francisco and very quickly rose through the ranks to become principal scientist after only four years and without a PhD. And I think uh, he found his liking for antibodies during this time and also saw interesting entrepreneurial opportunities um, at the interface of antibody engineering and bioinformatics. Um, so he left Pfizer in 2012 and founded his own company, Distributed Bio, also in uh, South uh, San Francisco, which he still leads today as uh, president and CEO. And um, what is really remarkable is that Jake started and grew distributed bio in parallel to going back to school and pursuing his PhD at Stanford University. 
jointly mentored by Mark Davis and Scott Boyd. He received a PhD in computational uh, systems biology in 2017. And uh, his thesis project on identifying specificity groups in the T cell receptor repertoire was published in Nature in the same year. And in fact, um, that's what I saw Jake present uh, at uh, the immunology meeting in Havana, Cuba, uh, four years ago. And I thought, man, this guy is going places. So I'm, I'm really glad um, that we were able to win uh, Jake for a seminar today. Um, to the audience, um, please use the Q&A feature uh, to submit your questions during and after um, Jake's talk, then I will read them um, and uh, Jake will answer them after his talk. So thank you, Jake, uh, for being here. You're on. Thank you very much for having me on and hello everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me this afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we can begin. If it's okay, I'm gonna share it in presenter mode like this because sometimes I have noticed that the slides don't advance when I try to uh, make it full screen. So I've slightly adjusted the title of my talk. Um, I, like many others, uh, religiously read uh, many of the studies that come out of the Scripps Institute. It's one of my favorite places to go look for my favorite topics, which have to do with adaptive immune repertoire uh, interfaces between typically polymorphic pathogens and polymorphic antibodies. And how do you navigate and identify broadly neutralizing epitopes? Uh, and if, if those exist, why aren't we all generating them all the time? These are some of the most fascinating questions to me in immunology and Scripps is a beacon of consistently excellent research in that space. So thank you for um, inviting me to talk with you. What I was hoping to do at this time is uh, I'm going to share four different case studies that speak to efforts to immunoengineer breadth using computational uh, immunology and bioengineering techniques. And the reason I'm sharing these four, they sort of fit together because they allow us to ask what, uh, what are the, the possibilities and constraints about the nature of adaptive immune interfaces, the, the flexibility of breadth. The first case study will be one on HIV and using in vitro systems to discover broadly neutralizing antibodies and ask the question about how fundamentally necessary is it that anti-HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies have to be heavily mutated? Is that a requirement to hit those epitopes or is that a consequence of the, the torturous somatic heart mutation history in vivo? Uh, second, we'll talk about our COVID-19 therapeutic program. And specifically, I'm asking the fundamental question, can we take anti-SARS antibodies and adapt their specificities while preserving their functions? Because those antibodies we already studied for years, we know they're neutralizing and in vivo protective. If we can do that, that's a powerful technique to rapidly repurpose uh, molecules across evolutionary distances as new pandemics uh, or new outbreaks emerge. Third, I'll talk a bit about snake venom. Um, and anti broadly neutralizing antibodies against snake venom toxins. And the real purpose of the question is, first off, it's, it's practically useful, but the, the real question is, can you do that in vivo through periodic immunization with multiple different uh, strains, in this case, species of snake? And if that works in snake, why doesn't that work in flu when people have tried a similar approach? And we'll talk about that a bit. And then finally, I'll wrap up with the hard one, which is um, trying to coax the immune system to recognize conserved sites on fundamentally poly polymorphic surfaces. And really the question, why do we miss? Why, why, if these conserved sites exist, why does the immune system uh, seem so reticent to target them over a non-conserved epitopes? And I'll provide what I see as a part of that puzzle and a part of the solution. So we'll kick off first with HIV. This is a short and sweet little case study. Uh, and the two interesting questions I want to address with it is really, first off, what is it that makes some epitopes or targets challenging? Uh, and in that sense, HIV to me fits into a subcategory of a number of other challenging targets that we go after using these technologies we've developed, uh, including GPCRs and ion channels, peptide MHC complexes, typically things that are hard to hit in a specific way. And the second question is really just, are heavily mutated anti-HIV BNABs a true requirement? Um, the studies that showed that you revert to germline, you lose uh, 
the specificity or affinity of a BNAV, does that really mean that they have to be mutated to recognize those epitopes? Or does that just mean when you go germline molecules, you lose binding because you're no longer recognizing the version of HIV that it originally recognized? Um, so this is a, a study that was conducted. Uh, it also sort of fits in the story I'm about to tell you about COVID-19 because I was flying out to Washington, DC to the BioThreats meeting in January 29th of this year. Uh, we had recently done this work with Peter Kim at Stanford University, and we were presenting it to Barda and DARPA. Uh, the, the study was as follows. Uh, Peter Kim at Stanford had contacted me. He was interested in trying to see if he could generate broadly neutralizing antibodies against a semi-conserved surface um, on the HIV co-protein. They had uh, engineered variants of the, uh, the, the region and stabilized them through some very you know, clip, clip technology. Um, but he had struggled to generate um, antibodies against that surface when he immunized animals. And then I think they tried to use display library and it was also unsuccessful. And the reason he reached out to me was that he knew that I had been working for some years on trying to build these computational optimized libraries that I'll talk about in the next two slides. The, the goal with these libraries was to try to better diversify the population of clones. It's a numbers game to have more unique antibodies by orders of magnitude. And the idea is that if the reason we miss these hard epitopes is just a probability problem, then having a much larger library could solve it. So uh, we had run a study, it took about three weeks and we had uh, he had produced the three different, uh, four different strain variants of the target epitope, and we rotated between them round after round. In an in vitro library, when you pan the library round after round, we use magnetic feed manipulation robots, the antigen um, and the, the antibodies are fixed. There's no affinity maturation taking place. And so we were able to basically select for breath if such breath exists. And we were pleasantly surprised to find that, yes, indeed, we could find a set of antibodies that were broadly neutralizing. Um, one hit, you know, single digit animal are in almost all cases with the strains that they tested and they were functionally active out of this process. The, the interesting thing was that those antibodies also didn't have any mutations in the germline and they, they didn't have abnormal insertions or deletions uh, in the CDRs. And we were able to find binders, although there were regene biases from the 16 scaffolds we tested. So this really told you with a large enough library, it is not a fundamental limitation that these epitopes can only be accessed with certain B genes um, or heavily mutated interfaces. Where you just need a large enough number of shots on goal. Um, there's practical implications there in terms of being able to easily express these materials um, for therapeutic development. So this, uh, the we were, reason we were able to, to hit these targets, and I don't really want to spend that much time on this because I'm actually going to describe a different technology for COVID-19, but the, the way we were able to hit these targets by building a much bigger library was a consequence of applying high throughput sequencing technologies to look at people's immune rep repertoires and understand how much diversity actually is there under the hood pumping through your veins. Uh, what I'm showing on the left is that while you may have 10 to the 11 B cells in your body, th there's a much more modest diversity of 10 to the seven, maybe 10 to the eight naive B cell receptors. And then it's really only a few hundred thousand memory B cell receptors that are detectable in the peripheral blood because most of your secondary lymphoid organs are where your memory is stored. So given those constraints on PBMCs, we came up with this new library design where we would capture H3 diversity from the naive compartment and memory diversity for H1, H2, L1, L2, and L3. And that process of parsing out better diversity from different regions where the H3 diversity is important in the, it's about a hundred times more diverse than the naive compartment, but it only contains diversity there. Whereas the memory compartment is less diverse in total, but it has all the somatic hypermutation. By pulling them out and combining them, we were able to leverage combinatorics and come up with these radically more diverse libraries with much less clonal redundancy. And so that was the basis of why we were hitting these epitopes more easily. Uh, and this fed into a general observation we've had on uh, GPCRs, ion channels, some anti idiotype work, and anti peptide MHC, and so forth. These kind of traditionally hard targets we've been getting pretty good traction on with these, these computationally optimized libraries, which leads me to kind of a point here that there has been sort of a mysticism or argument around GPCRs and ion channels where the community has been very frustrated targeting them. And therefore they came up with these odd arguments that well, maybe the human repertoire is fundamentally maladapted towards recognizing a GPCR. We need a, we need a chicken or we need a llama or some other abnormal topology to target these epitopes. Um, 
I don't, I think our data is showing that's not really true. The, it was really just that these are fundamentally difficult. So the probability of success was low, but you can adapt to that by having a thousand times more shots on goal that will make sure that you hit something which is a hundred times harder. So it's really just a probability challenge. And you're gonna see me return to that sort of concept over and over again on how do you beat challenging systems by just providing enough shots on goal to, to attack them. So that was the kind of a, the thing we were gonna go present to uh, DARPA, but then we showed up and they're like, forget all that, we want to talk about COVID. So this is the next case study and this is our, this crazy program that we started in January 29th and now we are wrapping up safety and talks and manufacturing and planning to go into clinic, which is the latest program I've started and it's going to be the fastest one we put into a human. Um, and what I'm going to be describing is the way that we achieve this. Uh, I just showed you that HIV thing with these big libraries, but I actually in January decided that still wasn't fast enough because it would still have the problem we have to discover a bunch of binders, figure out which ones we're neutralizing and then spend time optimizing them. And I wanted to skip that two stage process. And so I wanted to ask whether we could evolve uh, known in vitro neutralizing and in vivo protective anti-SARS antibodies the years of work had already been spent on them and immediately optimized them to affinity mature them and thermostabilize them to recognize the novel coronavirus. Um, and, and the kind of cool question there is if you can do that, it, you know, or to the extent you can do that, it teaches you about how much specific epitope paratope interfaces are fundamentally limited by breadth. And so the HIV case, I allowed the system to search for broadly neutralizing epitopes. Here instead, you're starting with epitopes that are dictated by those molecules and you're asking how much flexibility is there to overcome specificity. Uh, the reason, I'll just step back for a second and say the reason why I thought an antibody therapy was something worthwhile is the following. We know that about 20% of people get very sick, 80% of people don't. Um, and it's the 20% of people that require hospitalization and have risk of death and slow recovery that is the source of the entire pandemic medical crisis. Uh, for the mild people, if everyone was mild, it wouldn't be a crisis. Um, we have vaccines, uh, but not everyone will take them and they will not work uh, in everyone who receives them. And so for that reason, even with the appearance of vaccines, which I think is, is likely to be successful from Pfizer, Moderna, potentially others in December or January, we still need therapies for people who are sick to reach a hospital. And ideally we need a preventative for people who just got sick so they don't get sick in the first place, the same way that we treat rabies. And for both of those, I thought antibodies were gonna be our best bet because they have a storied history of being able to be effective medicines against scary things like Ebola and rabies and Hep C and a number of other pathogens. Um, so this was the approach that we took. What I'm showing you here are five antibodies that I found on January 29th. Uh, they were anti-SARS. They had crystal structures developed for four of the five of them. The last one, the crystal structure became available in the middle of our study. I'm zooming in on the spike protein, um, and we're looking at well, we're looking at the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-1 uh, spike. And I, what I've done is I've highlighted in yellow the positions that differ between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, where positions that are conserved are in blue. It's a 74% identity at the amino acid level. What you can see is that these five antibodies, what they all have in common is that they neutralized SARS. We have crystal structures. Some of them came from healthy human libraries. Some of them came, one came from an immunized mouse, two came, came from convalescent SARS patients um, back in 2003, four, seven, six, basically around the SARS outbreak. What was attractive about them is that they already had a bunch of function. And so if you could adapt those molecules, you can, you can build, we can build a library easily of a few billion versions around an antibody. Uh, and then if we can adapt specificity at the same time, we can improve the affinity and improve the thermostability to make them more readily available for subcutaneous injection and generally make them a better drug. Uh, the less time you can spend on discovery and the more time on optimization would be a good thing, provided that we can overcome the fundamental limits of these epitopes. Uh, what they all have in common is that they neutralize according to a pretty uh, meat and potatoes mechanism, the receptor binding domain, and maybe everybody already knows this on the call, so apologies, but the receptor binding domain is the tip of the spike. It binds the ACE2 receptor. It uses that as this little grappling hook to engage the cell, fuse the membrane, bing, bang, boom, pop you full of RNA and sad you are indeed with a new infection affected cell. So shown in green here is an antibody. This is the parental of our therapeutic lead. Uh, and it's basically binding in a way that's directly competing with the ability of ACE2 to bind. So it's, it's neutralizing the virus by blocking the ability of the spike to engage its co-receptor. Um, 
So the way we did this is that we generated a, for each of the five starting antibodies, and I picked five because I wasn't sure how successful this would be. Uh, we generated a, a couple billion versions of each one of the antibodies. Now, a couple billion seems like a lot, but it's actually a tiny little infinitesimal portion of the, the astronomical variation that's available if you diversify all the residues in the FB. So we were very strategic choosing uh, just regions in the CDRs to diversify, just natural variation um, drawn from, from, from human bodies and also synthesized and with specific other structural constraints in place. So we were basically making a very careful strategic diversification given a finite search space. Um, and we were unsuccessful in all five cases. One of them later dropped out during IgG reformatting, but from single chain FE, we managed to convert them all. Um, what I'm showing you here now, in addition to the mutations on the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 versus COV-1 in yellow on the RBD, I'm now highlighting in red all the positions that mutated in order to adapt these molecules to recognize SARS-CoV-2. So to start with, only um, this molecule, 6W41 had a, had a very weak affinity, 100 fold weaker than the to SARS CoV2 than SARS CoV1, and the other four were undetectable. After we performed this process, they were all single digit nanomolar or fecal molar binders. Um, you can see that many positions were mutated in parallel in order to adapt, and there seemed to be a, a general correlation between the mutations uh, on the antibody and the corresponding interface on where mutations were accumulating on the, uh, on the receptor binding domain. Um, a very large number of mutations were required, so a saturated library would not have achieved this. We did need this strategic library that would so be biased amino acid frequencies and CDR frequencies in order to sort of create a balance of searching deep enough into the space without making too many of our molecules so monkeyed out that they wouldn't recognize the target anymore. You can see that a large number of mutations were introduced to these molecules. Some of them we were humanizing, some we were germline adapting, and we made many modifications also to try to increase their therapeutic properties. So we heated them up to 72 Celsius, uh, deselected them against double-stranded DNA and histones and a number of other things that are sort of sticky or generically charged with the idea being that we wanted to try to put these things into humans. So we're pretty excited by it being able to convert, but we wanna know, okay, did they preserve their functions? It doesn't do us any good if they convert and bind the novel receptor, but they're sticky or they're, or, or they're not functionally active anymore. Um, so we first characterized and found that, yes, indeed, they seem to be binding, uh, for the most part, into the expected bins. So our leads and our best, new, our best binders were landing in the same bin with the ACE2 receptor, and there was some jumping of an unexpected, we think we kind of randomly diversified one clone, so it binds an epitope that's no longer relevant, but most of them appear to not have changed. Although, that said, we have not achieved crystal structures of the uh, of the, the post-parental variants. Um, so we're basing our assumption that it hasn't changed based on retention of function and uh, cross-blocking with ACE2. Uh, these things bound quite high affinity. So um, our lead candidate is 1.4 nanomolar at 37 Celsius. So we always test at body temperature and not just at 25 Celsius because there often can be a significant drop between what you think you have at room temperature and, and what you really get when you go in vivo. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. I think that's even higher affinity than the, the parental against SARS-CoV-1. Uh, we then sent these antibodies out to five uh, laboratories. So there's three of them shown here. This was US AMRED, Department of Defense, uh, Galveston National Labs, Stanford University with Peter Kim, the Temperton Lab in University of Kent, and Sinobiological in China. And we sent about 50 antibodies out and they basically all relatively well agreed on the rank order of the neutralizing clones, and they all basically picked the top two clones that they all agreed were the most potent. Um, that was pretty exciting. This is particularly in a period where there was a lot of scary things going on with those IgG tests showing a lot of false positives. So it was nice to see that these five labs, some using wild type virus, some using pseudovirion particles, using different protocols and different people, were all largely agreeing on the same results. Um, this is going to show up in the paper soon, but the point here is I've sort of mapped them and you can see the relative rank order with blue being uh, weak and white being very good or yellow um, shows that everybody pretty much agreed that B9 was our favorite, followed by E2, followed by F1, and then there's some stuff down here that nobody liked. There was a little bit of relative shifting of the UTMB, uh, you know, wild type virus, was a, it's a tough one, so it's harder to neutralize. The Kim Lab one seemed like it had the best ability to neutralize, uh, it was a pseudovirion approach but the rank orders were similar. So that was attractive to us and I didn't have to have any coronavirus in my lab and we got five independent labs all agreeing, yes, you should work on F1, E2 or B9. 
And so at that point, it came down to therapeutic properties, and that's where B9 had a significant advantage. And keep in mind, we want to be able to deliver this as a subcutaneous injection. Uh, so next was, okay, but does it protect hamsters? So we sent it out to uh, US Amarit and uh, Galveston National Labs. And we had both a therapeutic assay and then a prophylactic. And then there was also an immunocompromised, so cyclophosphamide immunocompromised prophylactic assay. So in the therapeutic one, the animals had received 100,000 PFU of virus. 24 hours later, they, um, they got 15 mg per keg of Arseni B9 or, or they didn't. And with, within 48 hours after that, there was a 97% reduction in viral load in their lungs. And I'll show you in a bit, there was a bunch of resolution of lung or avoidance of lung pathology. So it looked very potent in, the, in, a, in a reasonable dosage. We weren't putting some crazy, crazy dose into these, these hamsters. The prophylactic setting, um, this, these are showing body weights. Uh, and what you're seeing here is that the animals, they received the, anti the antibody IP 24 hours before becoming infected, again, with 100,000 PFU. Uh, the animals that got the antibody continued to gain weight, whereas those that didn't get the antibody deteriorated. And the similar thing was observed with the immunocompromised hamster model. So this is pretty cool. This is, we took antibodies against SARS, adapted them, increased their affinity, and now show that they preserved their functions of neutralization and, uh, and, and protection. That's, that's, a, that's a handy thing to have because most new viruses that we see are related to other viruses we've already run into, and we've built up a war chest of antibodies. So even if we don't have a perfect VNAV, this tells us that we can pretty reliably adapt these things. We did it five out of five times. I would say four out of five because one of them didn't uh, survive the, the IgG reformat. Uh, so we were kind of excited about that. Uh, this is just showing some tissue results. This is lungs. If the hamsters got the 15 mg per keg, their lungs were looking much better than the hamsters that didn't. I am not a uh, tissue pathologist, but you're looking for these little kind of more airways open. This is quantified here as percent infiltrated airways, um, significant reduction if you have the medicine and again, significant viral load. So this is doing all the good things you want. The hamsters are running around eating, getting chunky if they having cleaned up lung tissue and reduced uh, viral load. Uh, so that made us happy. Um, this is more for those who are interested. Um, this is gonna come out in the paper soon. It's just describing the studies that were done at the two facilities and then some additional antibodies and viral, viral titers and so forth. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll move forward. And if anybody's interested in the slides, please, con please contact me. <clears throat> um, so in addition to the FD engineering, so what I didn't really go into so much is that we also thermostabilized our library. We heated it all up to 72 Celsius at each panning run. And the effect of that is in other programs we've run, we see that that typically doubles the expression level um, my theory is that it's more antibodies are folding up properly and less likely to misfold. And so you have less, um, you know, malformed toys falling off the conveyor belt as you go. Uh, the other nice thing about it is it lets you concentrate the molecules better. So Millipore Sigma is currently doing our manufacturing. The cells were engineered by Adam and we're getting over five grams per liter, which is quite good. We're happy with that. And they're concentrating, we're routinely storing them at, uh, at 120 mg per mil. And we're able to concentrate them up above 200, and we're trying to figure out how high we can get that. But that puts you in a position of being able to, with a single two mil injection or two two mil injections, to put a pretty high dose of an antibody into a patient, which is which is very attractive for an out of the hospital um, treatment. So that's the FE engineering. In addition to that, we did two different mutations. Um, we did a safety enhancement Genentech Lala mutations in the hinge. And there's kind of four reasons for that. This is again, uh, controversial. I think there's some people who've done the opposite and they've chose to enhance effector functions and, and they may prove to be right. Ultimately, we're going to find this out in clinic. Uh, but there were four things I was worried about with leaving effector functions in on the molecules. Uh, one was that I knew that the virus infects many different organs, including brain tissue, heart, lungs. You know, and, and I was just concerned that if our antibody starts decorating those tissues, we could have an immune related inflammation and even tissue attack and cell damage um, on a whole bunch of tissues. I would prefer not to do that. Uh, I was traumatized a bit by a, st a study back when I was at Pfizer where they produced an anti amyloid beta plaque antibody. They had a choice of either turning off effector functions or not. They kept them on and that study had problems because there was a significant amount of, there was plaque reduction, but there was also brain inflammation on a decent proportion of the subjects. So, so ever since then, I've always been very cautious about keeping effector functions in. 
Uh, I know some people like them, but they like them because of HIV. And that's the big case study that's an example. And, and HIV infects T cells. So hitting a liquid tumor, basically hitting a bunch of T cells is a really different problem than hitting brain tissue and heart tissue. So that, that's my reason for caution. And I could be wrong. Second concern is cytokine release. Uh, I wanna make sure that the, uh, the medicine is not causing an exacerbation of a cytokine release syndrome problem with macrophages getting overstimulated and other um, FC bearing cells, FC receptor bearing cells. Uh, then you have your classical ADE, which we know is a problem in other coronaviruses, could be an issue here. And then finally, everybody's rushing these medicines into people. We're all running good safety and talks. Everything looks good, but you know, mistakes happen. And so if there is an off-target specificity that's missed, um, it would be nicer to have the antibody be mute on arrival. So for all those reasons, we chose to uh, add the safety mutations. And ultimately in clinic, we'll see how things pair out. It looks like effector functions were not needed to go help out the hamsters. So I'm hoping the same is true in humans. And, and ideally, ideally it doesn't matter and then all antibodies are equally good, but if it turns out effector functions are a problem, we have a safe one. And then the last piece, this is short and sweet. We added in the Zincor half-life extension mutation. So this gives you more like 10, eight to 10 weeks of half-life rather than three to four weeks, which is pretty exciting for IV as well as for subcutaneous where you wanna take the medicine and have an extended period of protections. And uh, these were new mutations. You notice that the FB engineering is pretty far away structurally from the LALAM engineering, pretty far away from LS engineering. So a relatively safe assumption is the more distant you are in structural space, the more likely things are to be independent and additive. But of course you wanna check that. So. Uh, we first checked that we add the mutations together and it doesn't disrupt the affinity or the ability to neutralize and it didn't matter. You could pop them in just fine, either or in both. We show that the combination <clears throat> compared to wild type, LALA, LALA plus LS, um, with the LALA effector, uh, effector function muting was intact and as is previously reported. And we showed that the LALA, the LS mutations in complex with, in, in combination with LALA or the wild type was doing its job as well. So we combine these three different types of engineering on the same molecule and everything works as expected independently. And that's basically it. We're, um, this is the molecule. So again, we are um, nearing uh, completion of manufacture and gearing up towards clinical. It's been a wild ride to move forward here. And I'm very grateful to the many partners that enable us to do this. And and in general, I'm pretty excited for the implications of being able to make medicines like this, where you can rapidly adapt an existing molecule that you know is good and you've de-risked and adjusted it to a, to a new purpose. Is that something that can repeatedly come up uh, in, in pathology research? That said, I do think that BNABs are your ultimate solution. If you, if you have a BNAB that's good, you don't need to fiddle with it. And that is your ultimate goal. Um, before I shift gears, I just want to speak for a second because this is one of the gadflies that annoys me. Um, it is often said, well, antibodies are great, but antibodies are expensive and rare. And this drives me nuts because I don't think it has to be true. And I just want to show some numbers to illustrate my point here a bit. Um, so historically, it's been the case that antibodies, when people charge, say, $10,000 or more for, uh, for a treatment, it could be like 100000 if you're going back for repeated cancer treatment. And, and it has also been the case because of the historical reliance on CHO that typically more modest sized batches of antibodies are generated compared to small molecules like aspirin or Viagra or Lipitor. You can be generated in these massive vats. Um, so that's given rise to you know, the, the market focusing on these ultra high value but very effective areas. And, and fortunately that gives rise to people's belief, well, you can make antibodies, but you're not gonna be able to make enough and they're gonna cost too much. And, what I'm gonna to try to do right now is just briefly convince you that that is rubbish. Uh, it only costs about 100 to $200 a dose to manufacture, uh, a, a, say a dose for a COVID-19 patient. Um, that's a gram or two. Uh, if you're producing five, five, five grams per liter, that means that really uh, for the entire United States requirement, here I'm making some estimates about the number of people that would need an IV um, at a hospital or we receive uh, an injection outside of the hospital, the numbers are big, but they're not insurmountable. I'm looking at, um, you know, 300,000 doses here, grams required, which comes down to about 60,000 liters a month. And, you know, like Samsung has a 30,000 liter reactor. So you just run that once a month and you get another one going and that's, that's the US supply. So this is not um, outside of what is achievable. I also want to point out that if you decided not to make $10,000 a dose, you said, hey, you know what? Let's be more like iPhones and like be better for society. Let's say you made $200 or $100 profit per dose. You could still clean up. 
this is a working business model. This is not a charity and, and you could do a, uh, the world better good. So these are viable business models. I, I have a problem with people articulating antibodies as something that's not suitable to address this, this, uh, this disease area. And I think this is actually true outside of COVID towards a bunch of other neglected diseases. I'm happy to talk about that in the break because it's something that annoys me. All right, so anyway, I just wanna say thank you to the many partners here. In the interest of time, I'm gonna jump up jump over to the last couple short talks, uh, um, case studies, and then we can kind of discuss them all holistically and, and kind of what it is that we think we learned, what do we still not know, what didn't work. Um, but I just wanna say thank you for you know, the many laboratories and uh, organizations that have partnered with me to enable us to move this medicine forward. All right, so let's shift gears again to a kind of a sexy one. This is a snake antivenom broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, so, the, this is a question about the capacity of in vivo systems to generate uh, antivenom or BNABs in general. Like when does it work and when is it difficult to generate BNABs? Uh, it's a case study about an interesting person with an interesting um, medical history that gave rise to the ability to generate BNABs. And I think that's sort of the question we're gonna ask is like, why did that work here? And why does this not reliably work in other arenas like flu or HIV? Um, so first off, you know, I am attracted to uh, polymorphic surface problems. So uh, snakes were attractive to me because there's a bunch of different species of snakes. They all have the same homologous sets of toxins. And it seemed to me that there should be broadly neutralizing antibodies that could conceivably be raised against these shared toxin surfaces. In particular, the functional active sites that if they all need to go bind a receptor on you, there's gonna be evolutionary pressure to constrain that site, much as this is the case uh, with some of the BNAB epitopes against ACD4 uh, for HIV. Um, this is an example of some neurotoxins from Crate, Mamba, Taipan, and Cobra. And I've highlighted in red regions that are um, completely non-altered between the, the four species. So they tend to be towards the center, but there are loops and such that are present on the surface. I figured it was worth a shot to go look. Uh, I figured, I also like uh, snake antivenom as a, as a problem. I think it's, it's challenging in some respects and I'll describe the challenges, but it's also like really low hanging fruit. It's um, in terms of biotechnology compared to cancer research, right? Cancer research is really hard because you're having to fight uphill against hypotheses that may be incorrect uh, and an ever evolving hydra of an enemy. Whereas snakes don't, you know, I just said the word hydra, but really snakes don't evolve that fast. So if you can solve this problem one, well, well once you've done it forever, and there's a lot more people that are affected by snakes, maybe more than you might think. So, uh, you know, 15,000 or 20, I think 21,000 people a year in the United States have CLL, and that's a huge market. There's so many groups going after uh, that specific area in cancer, where it's two and a half million people a year that are bit by, by um, venomous snakes. 300,000 have permanent disabilities. They lose a leg or an arm or a hand, and they can't work anymore. And then 100,000 die. So it's a lot of people. It's, most of them are in poor countries. Um, but there's ways that you could make a financial viable business model here by supporting, getting support from militaries and, and hospitals and subsidization. Um, the advantage is you know what the problem is, it's the venom. That's a much easier problem. And we already have uh, anti-venoms. They have a bunch of issues. They're typically sheep sheared fabs, uh, but they've proven the mechanism that antibodies can be effective. So this is sort of a ripe area for immune engineering to make a better medicine. Um, so here are the problems. Here's why people haven't done this so much. One is money. Uh, the second is it seemed like an insurmountable problem for two reasons. One is that there's 550 venomous snakes that pose a risk to humans. Um, you can't even read these phylogenies because they're so big. But the punchline is people would say, you know what, you're never going to get them all. Like you should just focus on individual snakes. And that's what they do right now. They have venoms that are spe anti venom specific to a single snake species or a very limited range. Uh, and uh, so that's a problem if you're in an area where there's multiple snake species because you get bit, you go to a doctor and they're like, oh, could you just go back out and like fish around in the, in the bushes and find the snake to fit you so we know whether we have the right antivenom for you? That, that's not a good look. So uh, it would be nice to not have to do that. So there's 550 of these snakes. Um, but the good news is there's really only 12 of them that, that pose the majority of risk of death and limb loss to humans. The rest of those all, they'll, they'll hurt, but you're probably gonna walk it off and be okay. So you don't really need to solve all 550. You can solve these 12, maybe 14, depending on how you define them. So the problem is already vastly reduced and, and it gets a little better. Um, the second part of the problem was that each snake produces 20 to 70 different proteins in their, in their venom. And that seems again, like an insurmountable problem just because you'd have to produce so many antibodies for each snake and then across so many snakes, that 
people just gave up their hands, threw their hands up in despair and said, we should just go polyclonal sera and, and go on a single snake species. But here, there's also more good news that if you align all of these sequences, uh, and there's functional ways to characterize them as well, they collapse down to basically 10 homology groups. So there's really just 12 snakes you care about and 10 homology, homologous family uh, groups of different types of toxins. And even in the set of 10, not all 10 are equally bad. Some of them are going to cause limb loss or kill you. Some of them are just going to be painful. And so there, there could really be a subset of those that are really critical to target. So this starts looking like something that could actually be tractable and something you could put in a tube. The challenge is, where are you going to find these antibodies? And that takes us to Tim Freedy. So I was Googling around um, a few years ago and I was trying to find people who worked at, you know, herpetologists who worked in vivariums who'd been bit a couple times. So I was talking to people in Costa Rica. And then I find this guy who's a herpetologist that has been 17 years doing, um, generating hyperimmunity for self immunization when he was retiring. And the way he would do it is he'd been immunizing himself with venoms from different snakes from around the world repeatedly in a cyclical process. And so I got very excited because First off, he could tolerate the venom, which tells me that he, he generated antibodies. But second, the way he was doing that by repeatedly changing out the, the venom species and going back to them over and over again, suggested to me that he may have done something remarkable with his immune system. And that is that he may have selected and continuously provoked and rewarded B cells for breath. Um, so I contacted Tim and this was basically the experimental design. Um, <laughs> He gets all the snakes, we pull out his blood, we use phage display and um, high throughput screening uh, and recombinant antigen engineering of the different venoms to isolate antibodies, uh, prove them out in vivo, create a cocktail, and that's an antibody. Uh, so that was the process. We started by generating a number of recombinant venoms. Um, this way we could control them. They could have FC and flag tags or his tags on them so that we could display them on magnetic beads and do very precise selection for breath the same way we did with HIV. Um, we were able to validate them against his plasma, uh, and, and we were also able to validate them in vivo doing um, MT, MTD studies. So we were able to prove that our, our recombinant venoms were able to get captured with these tags, and they were also able to um, be equivalently or nearly as active as the wild-type reported venoms in literature. Um, so at that point, we are pretty good. We fished out a bunch of antibodies, and this is an example from the short neurotoxins. Uh, this is a single, we have a B11 antibody and we have D9, they're related. Uh, the D9 antibody is ultra high affinity against the neurotoxin from Mamba, Taipan, and Cobra. Um, these are some of the best antibodies we've generated in our laboratory. So we were pretty excited by this. This is, uh, what? I've lost slides, hold on. All right, I accidentally destroyed the last, the punchline, but um, the punchline here is that we then took these antibodies and we put them into mice and the antibodies are completely protected. So the mice, uh, again, a single antibody, D9 is broadly neutralizing and in vivo broadly protective against the neurotoxin from Cobra, from Taipan and from Mamba. Uh, so we're partnering with Peter Kwong right now to establish crystal structures for this, as well as some antibodies that we have against some of the other um, convergent populations of homologs. And we think this is pretty exciting because it illustrates the importance of being able to, uh, to be able to generate BNABs against antivenom. That it, the, it's again, it's just a collection of homologs. We're hitting a shared site. And the attractive thing about that is that that makes now possible the concept of a broad, a broad spectrum antivenom that could be fully human and useful for everyone. I think the punchline here on like, why did this work is worth thinking about because we know that when we try cookie trail approaches like this with influenza, it doesn't result in naturally occurring breath. And I think the difference, my guess is that he kept repeating the process over and over again with a finite number of, uh, of, of venoms that didn't really change over time rather than constantly being challenged with new ones in his immune system affinity maturing away from history. That, that is my guess, but I, I don't know at this point. So I'm getting on to the, the end of our time, I think I'm gonna go over just a little bit to wrap up by talking a bit about, um, about influenza. So if, if you'd seen the Netflix documentary series, that's what the Gates Foundation supported our work for. And that's what we were doing in Guatemala was uh, trying to address the fundamental challenge of why do our immune systems miss conserved epitopes if they're always there? What, why, what is the nature of amino dominance of non-conserved epitopes? And is there ways that we understood it to overcome that? Uh, I recognize that this is an active area of research at Scripps and many other places. Uh, 
So I'm contributing my thoughts on the matter and hopefully some insights that you'll find useful with respect to how computational guide, uh, biology can guide, gain some new insights into what we think is going on here. And then some data we've generated to in vivo in three generations of pig studies that, that suggests that uh, our approach is working. Um, so this is just summarizing the problem. We've got hemagglutinin here. I've got a set of 6,500 different variants of hemagglutinin. I created a heat map of conservation and plastered it all over the, the, the trimer. And what you see is that immediately it highlights the very stable um, broadly neutralizing stem epitope uh, site and then a series of other locations that are recalcitrant to mutation. So the point is lots of sites can mutate. There's certain sites that can't. There's a nice patch there in the stem, but then there's also other sites that are present up in the, the head. The annoying thing is that the immune system seems like it doesn't routinely target that site, even though it doesn't seem that small. And there's other sites that are being targeted. And what's the deal? Why, why are we missing? That was a question which has sort of fascinated me about this since 2009. Um, so I've kind of reached towards computational immunology and computational biology to ask, can we learn something that give us some numbers? Again, getting back to that probability theory question of like, can we, can we assign some probability, some numbers on what are my chances of winning this? Like, why, why do I keep losing at poker? I want to understand the math to understand why I keep losing. Um, so first we looked at the human repertoire. So I told you before, there's about 10 to the eight unique B cell receptors in a person. We know from vaccine studies, from like influenza and ERK vaccines, that about a thousand B cell lineages get elicited. So we use, I use a tree algorithm to collapse down clones that all came from the same originally stimulated parental. And that gives you the number of about a thousand. And then George Giorgio's work has showed that about 10% of those are the ones that actually convert to plasma blast and release enough antibody to do you any, any good from a serological perspective. So you've got about a hundred shots on goal after a vaccine is the punchline here. That's a lower number than I would have expected. Uh, so the second question is, okay, well, how many, how many goals are there? How many epitopes are there on hemagglutinin? And I think what spurred me to go do this is I was reading some crazy paper that was talking about how there are six epitopes on hemagglutinin. And I found that very irritating because it didn't make sense to me. Um, and I wanted to get kind of, I asked, okay, how many ways can an antibody really bind to hemagglutinin? And so the way I addressed this is I took every solid crystal structure of every human antibody, there's about 450 of them, uh, non-redundant, I then took hemagglutinin and I used a massive cloud protein protein docking software to just dock 50,000 solutions over and over again with these different antibodies to come up with basically just keep searching the surface, not to try to find a correct answer, but just to say how many ways can an antibody bind to hemagglutinin in different orientations and different locations before you begin saturating to redundancy. The numbers were quite big, it was over a million. And it's actually much worse than that because we know that an antibody, the con not all residues in contact matter for contact. It's a critical subregion, a critical epitope is what I call it, that is what's important. We know that typically is 12 to 14 amino acids. It could be 10. Uh, and that, that's based on mutagenesis studies at the level of the CDRs of antibodies. And it's really the basis of how convergence works um, when you have uh, related antibodies that are not equivalent and find the same epitope, that there's a degeneracy of the necessity of finding a site um, it's the reason why F10 and CR914 both bind uh, basically the same epitope on influ influenza HA, but they have different breaths because they bind the same site, but they care about different residues. So when you take that into account, you're performing an induced K calculation, then we end up with this nightmare scenario where we have basically a database of billions of possible constellations of 10 to 12 or 14 residues on the surface of hemagglutinin. And so the cool thing you can do with that is I can compare that data now to uh, a database of those 6,500 different influenza strains. And I can ask, okay, of all the epitopes, if there's billions of possible critical epitopes, what proportion of them are universal? And the number ends up being roughly one in a million. And that's kind of simple and kind of profound because it says you just missed because there's an ocean of non-conserved epitopes and the, the ultra broadly neutralizing ones are just super rare. Now, what's more common are there's epitopes that are found across 90% of flu. And then you get a lot better if you go into epitopes that are broad with NH1 or with NH3. Um, those are a couple percent of your response. If you talk about 90% of H1s and H3s, then you're talking about 7% or 6%. But it's still the majority of your antibodies. If these percentages were a part of your 100 antibodies you got after a flu shot, you can see the majority of your antibodies were strain specific and they wash away once the virus changes. And that's why we miss, at least by my estimate, it's a probability game. The numbers are against us because the conserved epitopes are rare and they're overwhelmed by a bunch of strain specific epitopes. 
So that's cute. Maybe there's something we can do about that information. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip this. I will, so this is the method. We had tested in beach in silico, then went in vivo. And basically what we did is said, well, if we co-immunize a large set of hemagglutinins uh, all together, where each hemagglutinin is at too low of a dose to elicit an immune response, then strain specific B cells won't have enough antigen to activate, whereas B cells that recognize a more broad epitope will get a, basically a linear increase in the dose. And so therefore there's a dose relationship between the conservation of the epitope recognized and the, the concentration of antigen observed. Uh, that will result in, in uh, you know, T cell, better T cell simulation and so forth. And so this is showing as we dilute the mixture, we would end up anticipating greater breadth towards the future. That was the, the method. That way we could overcome that overwhelming ocean of strain specific stuff by essentially diluting it up. Um, so these are the studies. We first proved that a single dose at our, our low dose, we found a threshold where if you give it to a pig, they don't respond to that single antigen. Um, it's 50 nanograms. Whereas if we give uh, 27 different HAs, each of 50 nanograms, not only do you respond to those two that were in there, you respond to a bunch of other things uh, in the, each of 50 nanograms, as well as things outside of that cell. So that suggests to us that this approach was working. This is uh, data from the first study where compared to uh, bivalent, you get mostly response against the years immunized. We got this super broad re response by taking this mixture of 30 components, each one to dilute to elicit an immune response against self, but shared epitopes would therefore be at higher concentrations. Um, we have found a dose dependent effect where the lower you went with the individual doses, the more you concentrate towards conserved epitopes, which is consistent with the modeling. Um, this is just highlighting that same data in a different way. This is showing a bivalent reacting to the years that were in there, as well as a couple of years around it, where we end up basically hitting nearly a century of hemagglutinins using this, this concentration conservation coupling approach. Uh, we then shifted over and did neutralization studies. We pretended it was 2008. And so you can see the uh, bi bivalent from 2007 neutralizes the 2007 strains quite well. It doesn't neutralize any future or past H1s. There's a little bit of H3 uh, from 2009, 2011 that peters up, where our approach results not just in binding, but in neutralization all the way back to 1934 and then into the, the future, which was we only use components from 2007 or previous and was able to neutralize into the future past the pandemic 2009, all the way out to 2015. So this, this is confirming what the modeling suggests that this approach is selecting for B cells that recognize conserved sites and selectively stimulating them without being outcompeted by the strain specific. And that's resulting in not just binding, but in, in neutralizing. So that's the, uh, there's still work to be done here. We're still fiddling around with adjuvants and the number of shots. I'm happy to talk about that later, but the principle appears to be supporting the, the hypothesis. And there's a bunch of other pathogens that we could potentially go after with the approach I just described to you, because it really is relatively general. It's taking a panel of things that are all pretty distant from each other, mixing them together so each one's too dilute, but shared sites across them would be above an activation threshold and therefore preferentially B cells that recognize shared sites are rewarded. All right, so that's basically it, I think with respect to sort of conclusions and continuing challenges. With the HAV program, I think it showed that very big libraries help. This is a consistent pattern we're seeing with uh, other sort of historically challenging targets. Uh, the advantages are that it helps you identify molecules that have desirable developability characteristics. So very good expression, thermostability, germline, um, that could potentially be, be an advantage. Um, the challenge is that you have to go and do functional screening because you get a bunch of hits, you don't know where they're landing. With COVID, we asked a different question, starting with specific antibodies against uh, known epitopes, could we uh, alter them? And the answer was, yes, we could. Um, we also, I didn't show slides for it, but could you go find things which were um, broad? And the answer was kind of. We found some binders that were broad, but our best binders would lose the memory of SARS-CoV-1 and would target specifically towards SARS-CoV-2. So optimizing adaptation would cause a loss of the past, at least in the cases that we uh, that we picked. And so that, that tells me that, that maybe sort of a fundamental constraint, a given, a given epitope is a little bit sort of uh, locked in with respect to how much flexibility you have to, to, to generate breadth there versus, or maybe more challenging. Whereas if you really want breadth, it might be easier to start like we did with HIV upstream and say, okay, just find me the antibodies that are broad to begin with. And then let's work on already broad epitopes rather than trying to force a fundamentally not broad epitope to become broad. So you can adapt, but it doesn't necessarily create breadth. 
then antivenom, in that case, the, the antigens didn't change. You just you had a finite set and you kept reimmunizing with them over and over again. And so that it did give rise to his ability to select for breath in his immune system. That same approach serially seems like it doesn't work in other studies with influenza. I, I suspect it's because um, the antigens are changing um, over time. So it's not being able, if we cycled between six and six different flus over and over again with the same person, I bet they would generate some breath. That would be my expectation. But unfortunately that does not solve the problem of flu because flu evolves faster. So in that case, what we think is happening is that there's a overwhelming number of B cells that are strain specific uh, compared to the ones that are more conserved and that we can avoid that, that that portion of the distribution by administering a population of hemagglutinins that are individually dilute, but they, uh, they contain shared epitopes and that a mixture of those shared epitopes would therefore be above a threshold for activation and therefore those B cells would be preferentially rewarded. The challenges we face there are really in manufacturing that we can prove this out academically, but we're trying to build new technologies and convince Varda that we can come up with uh, viable solutions to go produce a vaccine that's like 30 or 40 valent because that's that's not how these guys like to work. Um, and, and so it's a little bit of a conceptual uphill battle um, provided we can get there. There's also some challenges around adjuvants. Okay, well with that, um, I just wanna, I think I'm over a little bit. Hopefully you have a time to talk a bit. These are some of the folks that helped us in the Guatemalan research group from the University of San Carlos, some of my team up here, and then these are the rest of the team members. Um, at that point, I realize I've talked over a little bit, but I just really wanted to share that story. And at this point, maybe I can um, take any questions and talk with the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Jake. Beautiful talk. Um, so again, audience, please um, submit your questions to the Q&A function. I see there are already two. Maybe, you know, I can start out, uh, Jake, regarding the COVID-19 antibody, uh, Senti B9, I think it is. What are your thoughts? Uh, we all know Regeneron is using a cocktail of two antibodies. Um, Lily is single antibody. It looks like you are also using a single antibody. So what, what is your thought on that? Yeah, so I think there's some advantages and disadvantages of, of each approach. The advantages of a cocktail, there's really two advantages of a cocktail. So uh, one of them is that in the first generation of new binders, uh, there can be synergy between antibodies if they're individually medium antibodies, they can synergize to become a better than, than just doubling the concentration of each of the members. So the synergy can be helpful, especially if you're, you're in a foot race. Um, <clears throat> that's not to say that the Regeneron, Regeneron antibodies aren't good. That's just saying that uh, combinations can give rise to synergy. Uh, the second reason is to avoid uh, escape mutants. Um, There's actually a lively conversation about this in a recent Q&A from Nature Biotech Publishing Group um, that I participated in as well as some folks from Scripps. And we, we talked about sort of how much do we think that mutation is going to be important here. There were some studies by groups that were creating cocktails where they set up in vitro conditions that, give, that appeared to give rise to escape mutants. Uh, we know this coronavirus doesn't mutate that much, but it also hasn't been exposed to a single molecule, which would definitely select for uh, escape we haven't really seen appreciable escape from like RSV monoclonals in the past. The Ebola molecule didn't see the, the, the single mono, the NIH molecule from Ebola didn't see a lot of that, but it is possible. So that, that's the, the advantages of a cocktail. The disadvantages are additional cost of and complexity of manufacturing of the material. So I chose a monoclonal. Um, First off, I'd optimize mine, so there was less of the advantage of the synergy. If you have a really good optimized clone, the synergy uh, the benefit goes away. Um, there still is the risk of immune escape. I am binding an epitope, which also engages ACE2, so the region is relatively conserved, but there are variations that could be generated. So my strategy here is I wanted a medicine where I, I, my goal is to charge you know, less than the cost of an iPhone for the therapy so that everyone can afford it. My feeling is mass produce this as the front line, and then I can externalize the cocktail to the market. So people can take this medicine first, and if they if they do, or if they are the 2% of people that generate escape mutants, for instance, then they could take the more expensive medicine as a second line of defense. The right. other advantage is giving it early is always helpful. The more virus you have in your body, the more opportunities you have for escape mutants. So or earlier you can administer uh, the, the antibody, it's more like kind of stamping out a match rather than having to put out a force <clears throat> fire. Yeah, and you mentioned you you are not losing sleep yet over having silenced the FC domain. I so yeah, uh, 
Again, I don't know until we hit clinic, but there are some, you know, potentially concerning things. There have been safety, as a safety pause on the, the, the lead drug. We don't know why yet it was therapy related and it could be not due to effector functions, but there was also um, both of the antibody therapies that it had it reported in an interim phase two analysis, both show that their highest dose was actually worse than their, their middle dose. Now that could be me radically over-interpreting things, but that could also be some immunotoxicity. And then there's, you know, there's a uh, murmuring about this and some of the complexities of the convalescent plasma um, results. Um, and, and also, you know, we, we're not sure what's going on with the safety with the vaccines. That really could just be, we dosed so many people, of course, some safety issues are going to come up, but, but for those reasons, I, I still think I made the right choice by silencing the effector functions. You don't need them and there's a bunch of risks by keeping them. So it may be irrelevant, but if it helps, then, then I've created a safer medicine. Yeah, I trust your intuition. So, okay, let's go through some um, questions. So there's one from uh, Sridhar Bale. Uh, great talk. Given the rate at which maps are being isolated for COVID-19, do you see any unique advantages of using antibody data from previous infection? And how do you uh, computationally design maps? Uh, how, how do your computationally designed maps compare to fished ones in efficacy if data is available. The second question is, um, any thoughts on computational design of a pan-corona map? Yeah. Is it even possible? Sure. So when I when I say computational design, I'm sort of, I'm existing in the middle land. I'm not fully like Baker Lab where they want to have a computer think up a binder. I, I, I applaud the work that they're doing, but it's just not there yet with antibodies. Otherwise that would have been a molecule. Um, and, and I'm not all the way into the full natural approach. I think the natural approaches, they were very fast, but they also had money. And the molecules that came out of people right away weren't always the most high affinity. So those ones were affinity matured or they're being complemented with additional antibodies now. Um, they had the advantage of moving quickly. So we, have, we do have these very cool single cell sorting technologies and cell sequencing. The challenge is that there's a great variability in the antibody quality and quantity that comes out of convalescent patients. So who you pick, and which cells you get are gonna influence your success rate. Um, the advantage of the computational method, what I did is I took real antibodies and then I, I basically acted like a poker player with a computer in their pocket. I, I strategized, okay, if I have a billion variants I can generate from this antibody, how am I gonna effectively populate that search space to be able to jump a gap? I, I know there's eight mutations on the epitope uh, or six mutations, right? That's a lot. What, what's my best strategic way of exploring variation in all six CDRs while also retaining the core properties of this antibody so I'm not just drifting too far off into nonsense space or creating non-viable molecules? And that's where computation comes in. I look at repertoires from thousands of people. So I only search the space that's been elected by evolutionary forces. I bias the diversity in each CDR. So it's basically a little bit of a hedge of the original molecule versus how much I'm willing to search into single, double, triple mutations outwards. Uh, and then ultimately you synthesize it and you run the test. The advantage of that process is that I jumped immediately into, uh, into optimization. So I, I, I don't know the exact, um, I know that I'm better than one of the other groups out there with respect to affinity. Um, I, one of the other ones I heard is better than mine. I don't, I don't know. Um, the, I, I, there's a little bit of a balance of where it helps and where you get diminishing returns of increasing the affinity. In general, if you get a really high affinity, you can go with the lower dose, which is, which is an advantage. Um, we're in the position where we're pretty happy with that. And I think we did better than some of the other molecules, but I think there's another one that also affinity matured that it looks really good. The other, the, the other thing we did, right, is we heated the library up. So we got this ultra thermostable molecules, and that means we're going to be able to concentrate above 200 mg per mil. And that puts us in a position of having a subcutaneous injection of a stable therapeutic that's very safe, you can get early. That's a, that's a big advantage. With respect to the computational design of a pan corona map, uh, I, I still think wet lab is what's gonna help take us there. I think you're gonna have to take, the challenge is with HIV, there's a whole bunch of strains we can work off of. We actually don't have that many examples from nature of the coronaviruses that infect humans. We have SARS, we have MERS, we have some colds, and we have the novel coronavirus. So, we would need to use, I think there are ways to do this, but we would need to use in, in vitro methods to generate populations of RBDs that have the, the constraint in them that they still recognize ACE2 and then use that as a bait. So that, that is a process that could work, I think, but um, I, I just I decided to just focus on the problem in front of us for now, and then that, that could be a process for the future. But the limitation is that not all coronaviruses even use ACE2, so that would only allow you to block at least the ACE2 interaction. 
Yeah, so there's a related question from Mohamed Saleh, um, a PhD student at the University of Toronto. He says, uh, fantastic talk. Are you planning on using your uh, multi-antigen vaccination approach to develop a pan-coronavirus vaccine in the future? So first off, hey, Mohamed. Um, so we, we looked at the coronavirus um, back in January. And the reason that we decided to focus on um, on, on, on an antibody was that there's a bunch of other groups doing vaccines and they were doing them, you know, they're doing them well. We didn't think the mutation rate of the coronavirus really justified our technology and nature hasn't given us the bounty of versions. So we were applying our Syntivax technology to flu. We're also running it um, earlier stage. We're doing piloting on HIV. Um, if you don't have as much a, a kind of a bounty of variants available to you from like from the basically from the da databases of public sources, then we can't stand on the shoulder of giants and use our technology effectively. Even with dengue, it would be a challenge because you basically have four branches of a tree. So we would have to artificially diversify the, the branches of that tree before we could apply the Cinevax technique. And, and the same was true of coronavirus. There just wasn't enough known variation for it to justify our technology or for us to leverage it efficiently. So we have, we have not done so. Yeah. There's another uh, question from a graduate student. This one is here at Scripps uh, in Florida. Adam Gatzler, he asks, uh, great talk. I had a question about the antibody diversity problem. While individuals have a low chance of developing having the right antibody available, I imagine on a population scale that individuals exist that do have them. Do you think the natural occurrence of such antibodies is stochastic or selectively programmed epigenetically by SNPs or some other hardwired way? I'm going to do the annoying thing and say kind of all the above, but it's largely stochastic. And uh, we did some studies with Wayne Morasco at Harvard. We were looking at the effect of the B gene alleles. So these are the different alleles of the B segments on the IGH locus. The locus is very polymorphic. And when you see that, that's a smoking gun that tells you that Nature basically is lazy. And so if nature is deliberately maintaining a bunch of alleles in a population, there's usually a good reason for it. Um, so we went and looked at the IgHV1-69 uh, allele, which is associated with, it's over, it's over um, represented in broadly neutralizing antibodies against influenza. And there's a couple different uh, common alleles that are found there and they're maintained under balancing selection, which is what keeps them in the population. Uh, one of them has a hydrophobic ring that pokes out of the CDRH2 and then a proline sort of keep it poking out and the other one doesn't, it has a leucine. I think it's a leucine here, it's a nice leucine. Um, and what, what was found was that almost all of the antibodies, even though the alleles are at similar frequencies, almost all of the antibodies that were broadly neutralizing had the, had the aromatic ring. And crystal structures show that that aromatic ring was basically stabbing into a hidden cleft and creating hydrophobic contacts. And so it seemed like that allele was important and moreover people that were homozygous to not contain that allele they ended up uh, having a little bit worse titers and then, then this, presumably their immune systems would find other solutions um, on they could still produce neutralizing titers it wasn't like one antibody would rule them all but their immune systems had to go find some other solution so that tells me there is some genetic effects but it's also like it's not enough that like the people with the wrong allele got weeded out so there uh, I, I, I think the adaptive immune function is very robust it creates lots of, uh, you know, creates this massive field of hundreds of millions of solutions. Um, if you don't have that antibody or that, that B gene present, then you'll find other solutions and you will be protected. Um, but we know that this is kind of true because if the system was brittle, then we, different species and people with different allele topologies wouldn't work out. But we know that B gene populations are quite different like mice and chickens and rabbits and donkeys. And yet all these organisms are, you know, living happy, healthy lives. So it, it tells us that the, the stochastic aspect is fierce enough to overcome the components. They probably queue up the system towards certain probability preferences, but ultimately this, the, the stochastic sampling uh, overwhelms it. I, I, there probably are, you know, there are SNP effects. Um, there are also epigenetic effects, you know, with immunosenescence and the capacity of the cells to mobilize and store productive immune memory. And that's obviously a very complicated topic, but that, that stuff plays out. Um, the really cool thing is that even if you take identical twins, monozygotic twins, you give them both the same flu shot, they do not produce any of the same antibodies. Like that, to me, that is awesome, fascinating, um, but very annoying if you're trying to go create a database of known binders. Right. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, last question, because we have to jump over to another meeting. 
uh, is by Haiyong Peng, and he's sp uh, asking about one antibody in particular, CR3022, which recognizes and neutralizes SARS-1, but only recognizes SARS-2 without neutralizing. So he's wondering whether you try to evolve it to, uh, to also be able to neutralize SARS-2. If you guys remember, I said four of the five antibodies had crystal structures available at the beginning of the study, and the fifth did not. The fifth was uh, CR3022, and our evolved version. So the original one was like around one nanomolar to SARS uh, CoV1, and a little over 100 nanomolar to SARS roughly to SARS CoV2. Um, after our process, it's now uh, around one nanomolar binder at 37 degrees, and it's a potent neutralizer. We chose not to go forward with it compared to B9 because it is a little bit less stable. So for us, it wasn't they're, they're equivalent, nearly equivalently potent, um, maybe even more so, but it seemed to have some stability issues when we were trying to concentrate them super heavily. And, and that's important for us because we're trying to go deliver these subcutaneous injections. Uh, but the answer is yes. Thank you very much, Jake. Thank you, everybody, for asking super interesting questions. Again, Jake, thank you so much you know, for spending time with us. It was uh, extremely um, interesting. And I think we all learned a lot. So thank you, everyone. And um, we have to go over. You have the link to the other meeting, right? <laughs> thank you, everybody. And again, I, it was a privilege to be able to speak with Scripps and the academic research community. Thank you.